infidelity. And today we're discussing the betrayed. And in the next twin episode to this on the subject of infidelity, we'll be getting letters from the betrayers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting when we think about this. My theory is that throughout the course of a life, most of us are in each position at one point or another, right? Mm -hmm. I know I certainly have been. I think that when people really take stock of their romantic lives at the end of it, they find that that's true for them too. Is it true for you? Yeah, I've been in both of those roles. And the truth is most couples in their lives, most long-term monogamous relationships, there is some infidelity. If we count emotional infidelity, we could say, oh, that's near to 100%. And I would say most often infidelity of whatever sort is a symptom as much as it is a sin. And it might mean that that relationship is not meant to be, and these people have evolved and changed in ways that they can't reconcile. But more often, I think, and statistics sort of back this up, it's a symptom that there are real troubles and needs are going unmet probably on both sides, and they need to somehow figure out how to cure the relationship. Well, I think sometimes, too, that it's not a symptom of something wrong with the relationship. In some cases, I mean, obviously, that's true in many cases. In some cases, it's really a symptom of something going on in in one of the individuals in the relationship. Yeah. I mean, I also think that one of the problems is just long-term monogamy. Right. You can have an absolutely beautiful, solid love for each other. And, oh, my goodness, you know, a few years ago, I went for a run. And I'm, you know, just running through the park. And, you know, at this time, I'm like a mom. I'm like 40. And and this guy, you know, passes by me. And he gives me this kind of like, hey, baby. Hey, baby. And such a thrill went through my body. I smiled and laughed. And then tears came into my eyes. <gasps> because I was like, my husband every day tells me I'm beautiful, which is so lovely. But there was something about this stranger kind of going, hey, baby, that I, I miss that in my life. And mm-hmm. I think that... Everyone in a long-term monogamy does. And sometimes that makes you vulnerable then. Right. Oh, there's this wonderful quote. It is touch that is the deadliest enemy of chastity, loyalty, monogamy, gentility with its codes and conventions and restraints. By touch we are betrayed and betray others, an accidental brushing of shoulders or touching of hands, hands laid on shoulders and a gesture of comfort that lies like a thief, that takes, not gives, that wants, not offers, that awakes, not pacifies. When one flesh is waiting, there is electricity in the merest contact. Mm. Yeah, I think that we can be really high and mighty Mm -hmm. when we're young, when we first fall in love. There's this kind of idealized version of how this love will play out. I know I get a lot of letters, you know, when I was writing the Dear Sugar column from people saying things like, if my lover ever cheated on me, it would be absolutely over. Right. Once you're a little further down the path, you see that it's not so simple. Sometimes people who truly love each other and, and should stay together cheat on each other. Right. Sometimes cheating is a sign that that relationship is dead and over. Mm -hmm. Not always. There isn't one answer that we apply to every relationship. That's right. Let's hear this first letter. Dear Sugars, I'm highly introverted. I spent most of my adolescence and early adulthood single, thinking I was unlikely to marry and have a family, about which I felt mostly content. Sure, I had my warm-blooded moments, but mostly I felt that as a woman, any status and fulfillment I gave up by not being someone's wife and mother was worth the freedom and solitude. But 13 years ago, when I was in my late 20s, I met a man who became my husband. Our bond and the joy and comfort I drew from it made it effortless for me to dramatically change my life and be someone's other, and within a few years, someone's mother. I'd never been so happy. It took me by surprise. Normally a reserved cynic, I actually believed, Sugars, that I had a nearly perfect, a most unexpected life, that I had stumbled into big lottery luck. However, after our second child was born, I felt what I thought was pedestrian marital strain, so I found us a therapist. Just as we began, I discovered in a very traumatic way, meaning police at my door late one night, that my husband and my close friend had been keeping secret company for a year and escalating emotional infidelity at least. It was devastating, of course. Five years later, we are still limping along. We've done work. We've had some sweet moments. We're committed to raising our kids together. We try. But it's never been the same. I've never been the same, Sugars. And I know that's the deal. 
but I'm still often sad despite any hard-fought forgiveness and understanding I've managed to eke out. We have a nice life, but my heart never fully returned to it. Could it still? I think about future lives for myself, but I'm here for another decade and would like to make the most of it. Signed, Half-Hearted. Hmm. I was so bummed yeah. by this letter. I mean, I just felt so dispirited. I guess I picked up on how dispirited, half-hearted feels. Yeah, and you know, I'm really struck by the fact that it's been five years. Right. And it sounds like they've done a lot of work, and half-hearted still feels this pain. So many people who, so many couples who experience infidelity, if they do come out the other side, by which I mean they decide to stay together and, and, and do that, that work that it takes to have that understanding and forgiveness, so many of them actually look back on the affair not so much with gratitude, but a certain amount of awareness that it, it did in some ways make them stronger or closer. Yeah. It sounds like half-hearted thinks this destroyed her. There she is still in this relationship. She has some joy, but she's going through the motions and she wants to know yeah. if she'll ever feel whole again in this relationship. Yeah, I mean, I would say she's diminished by it. You know, it's mm -hmm. sort of as if really uh, the joy and comfort is gone and it's just survival mode. And it, what's interesting to me about this letter is it's quite um, descriptive of the circumstances and, you know, the basic scenario. But I think oftentimes the questions that are really important to ask and I don't know, maybe these have been asked in therapy, but, but if they have and if they've been answered, it hasn't yielded that deeper connection, the kind of regeneration that has to happen when there's a betrayal of this magnitude. Because this is no small thing. This is, I don't know what police at my door late one night means, but it's generally not a good idea. It's generally no. not a good situation. Um, and my husband and my close yeah, friend that, is another exactly, real bad that, sign. I think I was going to mention that too, because I mean, there's one thing to have a partner who said, look, you know, I was in this situation, I felt this desire, I don't know what I was thinking. Right. But this is, two people betrayed half-hearted. Right. The husband, and yes, did the close friend make a marital vow to her? No, but we still, listen, we, we're meant to be loyal to our close friends. So there's a layer of cruelty here. Yeah. Her husband didn't just have an affair with anyone. He had an affair with somebody who half-hearted trusted and loved and, and you know, considered a friend. Yeah, but... It, when we're talking about the betrayed, as she has been, I think it's very hard to get past that, which is absolutely true, and there's a lot of rage associated with it. But the mm -hmm. interesting question isn't, how could you do this? Although it's a completely reasonable, natural, and inevitable question. The interesting question is, why and why did you cheat on me in this way? Mm -hmm. What needs and desires that were unmet in the context of our marriage was this expressing? Are you angry at me in some way, resentful, in a way that would cause you to betray me in a way that's engineered to bring me so much of a sense of betrayal and unhappiness? How in your own conscious and unconscious mind have I betrayed you or has this marriage betrayed you? And here's where I think that it's good and important for the betrayed to question meaning. What does an affair mean? And this is why an apology is never good enough. Mm -hmm. And this is why absolution isn't enough in the case of infidelity, especially of this magnitude. Mm -hmm. What meaning did the affair have for you, and especially an affair with a close friend of mine? And I don't know if she's gotten an honest accounting of those things. If she has, and she still feels this dispirited and drained, I don't know, Cheryl. You know, as I've stated before on the show and in my writing, I don't think that infidelity is an automatic deal killer. Of course not. But for some people, it might be true that when their partner is unfaithful and has deceived them and had an affair with their friend, that it might be true that it's perfectly legitimate to say, I can forgive you, I can accept you and co-parent our kids with you, mm -hmm. but I can't maintain this relationship anymore. Loyalty is a really high value to me. Yeah. I don't want to be involved with somebody who has this history of having betrayed me and slept with my friend. And I think that that's perfectly legitimate too. I think it's, it's, it's as legitimate as working it out. And what's interesting to me is Half-Hearted has tried to work it out. And when I read this letter, what I see is not somebody who's blaming her husband for her feelings, mm -hmm. uh, not blaming that friend. She doesn't really even mention the friend beyond that one mention. Mm -hmm. I really think that she's saying this 
terrible thing happened in my relationship. And it so ripped me apart yeah. that it, it really can't ever quite be sewn back together the right way. And for a lot of people, it can be sewn back together. And not just sewn back together, but actually, you know, that very rendering of the bond is what made it stronger. Mm-hmm. I think that that is absolutely a, a, a true story, a true narrative for a lot of couples. Yep. For some reason, it's not for this woman. And that's okay. So then it becomes, what does she do with her half-heartedness? Right. You know, does she continue on? I think that you can make reasonable choices about continuing on. They do have kids, you know, maybe they can talk about an exit plan. Maybe she can go to her husband and say, I I presume she has, you know, I'm just not feeling it. You know, maybe we did actually damage something sort of irreparably. Right. Healing might look not like we want it to look. It might not look like we come back together. That's right. It might look like we gracefully and lovingly come apart. Right. Uh, Absolutely. Um, And I think it's important to note that. What's difficult for me to know, because there's nothing about it in the letter, is, is this a moment where you're looking at one another? Are we getting this letter now, Cheryl, rather than three years after this? Because she's got a kid in kindergarten, another one in second grade, and suddenly you have to really look and take stock and say, well, we've given all that time and equity and energy and attention and love to the kids, and we kind of allowed that to distract us from whether we really love each other and want to be married, and suddenly the kids are a little bit out of the picture and we have to face that question. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good and healthy thing to do, but she seems to be suggesting, you know, half-hearted, you're essentially saying, well, I got another decade in. It's a fait accompli. There's nothing I can do. I got to do it. Mm -hmm. I got to do it. And Cheryl and I are saying, do you? If you really feel half-hearted about this, is that absolutely the case? And is some of the purpose of your letter consciously or unconsciously for to have us say, why exactly do you have another decade in? Mm -hmm. Half-hearted, you were ambivalent about the idea of marriage from the beginning. You know, I'm often sad, despite forgiveness and understanding, we have a nice life, but my heart's never fully returned to it. Could it still? We have no idea. But if you have asked all of the right questions, and if you have told him, I am half-hearted right now, my heart has not fully returned to this marriage, Mm -hmm. I think we can say, you know, definitively, it's no kind of way to live to say, I've got 10 more years in this relationship that is making me feel diminished. So something's got to change. Yeah, I'm not, a, as you know by now, Cheryl, I'm not a believer in like, yes, you'll find joy and it will be wholehearted, but more than this. So innocently, I wasn't snooping or suspicious at all. After lots of questions and lies, my husband finally admitted that he had hired a prostitute while the baby and I were out of town. The deed happened in our home. This has come as a total shock to me. It's rocked me to my core. I learned of the infidelity while we were away from home, and I haven't been able to return to the house since, or probably ever. I feel so violated. My main issue is the deceit. I'm a very open person who would have welcomed an honest conversation about his needs and desires without judgment. He never told me about any unhappiness or sexual frustration. The optimist in me hopes this can be an opportunity to make our relationship stronger, but I don't know if I'll ever be able to trust him again. Where do I go from here? Signed, married to a stranger. Mm. I, I think, you know, that is a shock. We, we just talked about this letter where, you know, the letter writer has discovered her husband is having an affair with her friend. And here's this almost opposite situation. It's shocking and devastating in its own way. Yeah. Uh, to have an affair with a prostitute. I mean, the, the first letter is like cruel. It's your friend. This, it's premeditated. You're making a date. You're making an appointment, essentially, to have sex with someone, right? Yes, that is generally what happens. It feels that. well. It feels premeditated <laughs> yep. in a way that that is devastating. I feel so much sympathy for married Absolutely. to a stranger. Oh, what men dare do, what men may do, what men daily do, not knowing what they do, right? That's Shakespeare. Like, we're, men and women do these things. Well, most women don't hire prostitutes. Well, most don't, but some do. Yeah, and who? some Have Have you known anyone? Uh, I have got a long list that I will present you with <laughs> okay. at the end of this episode, you sexist. I've never in 46 years. Well, look, I mean, come on. I'm not yeah. saying that no woman on this planet has ever hired right, a prostitute, right. but I do think it gets a little silly to be like, okay, this like point zero 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 one percent of you know the the prostitutes sure. on the planet were hired you know by women. Sure, sure, absolutely, absolutely. Richard Gere, not aside, almost <laughs> all. Okay, but the point is, but no, Richard Gere slept with 
a prostitute, right? No, no, no. <laughs> I was talking about American His Gigolo. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, All got right. it, got it. So when a woman has just been pregnant and given birth and now has a little baby at home, and this is why I think the home component of this is so insanely important that she can't go back to that home because pregnancy and after pregnancy is a peak moment for women for bioevolutionary reasons that are pretty obvious it is intensely focused on making a home protection nurturance and making sure that that man is in 100 percent the peak of i need you to just be solid for me but at the same time what's going on on the man's graph is a completely different graph. We're jealous. We want to be number one. We really do. Not, you know, not everybody, not all, but most men, even evolved men deep down want that. And a baby comes along and lets us know very clearly in lots of ways that we're not number one anymore. And especially a first baby. And that's the bottom line. We're not number one anymore. And good, we shouldn't be. That baby has to be number one for a while, but it's tough for men to take. And the world just needs to know that. Is that a justification? Absolutely not. I mean, this is rotten behavior, uh, but it is an explanation. And it's why we see so many letters where the infidelity is triggered by the recent birth of a child or a second child or pregnancy, because those two graphs are out of whack. Yeah. I love that the letter writer says, you know, it's the deceit that bothers me. She's totally because on Because she, it. you know, yep. everything you just said about, the, you know, the, the differences between the female body and the male body at this moment in time, yep. you know, really speaks to what we've already said, which is married to a stranger. I hope you can know this in your heart. Your husband's decision to do this isn't about you or your attractiveness or, or even his desire for you. You know, I don't excuse it either. I think he did a terrible thing. I think he was an inconsiderate guy to do this. I think it's absolutely wrong. I also think that, you know, in some ways, he might have been making the decision to hire a prostitute to really just get a sexual need met. He doesn't want to go fall in love with somebody else. He's getting his emotional needs met. And so I hope that it's helpful for you to the extent possible that you do try to detach your sexual intimacy with your husband from this act he committed. Part of what hurts about it happening in your home is is you are probably attaching all of this emotional stuff to what he did, because of course you should. When you and your husband have sex, it is love. It is intimacy. It isn't just sex. And he brought this other person into your home and had a very different kind of sexual experience. He brought a bad scent into the cave is what yeah, he did. Yeah, which is, again, wrong, 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 right. really awful. You know, if you're cheating on your partner, maybe don't do it in the home. Like, it's, it's devastating enough. We don't need that extra layer, right, to put our partners through that. And we should note also, she's just been dislocated from her culture and her, she's, they moved to a foreign country because of his job opportunity. So all of this is happening on terra incognita without her supports around, without her family and friends. That's probably partly why he felt he could hire a prostitute because they don't have those sorts of checks around. It is so devastating. I mean, you know, to me, when I was cheated on, the thing that like blew me away the most is how devastated I was and how personally I took it, even though I myself, when I had been the cheater, yep. had said to the person I loved and cheated on, this is not about you at all. It was only the sex act and it meant nothing. And I think in some ways that, that you know, you're the person who cheated on you saying it meant nothing. On one hand, that's a comfort. On the other hand, it's even more devastating because you're like, oh, you did this thing that meant nothing. It really meant nothing to you. And it hurt me this much. You're like, you're willing to hurt me this much for to trade uh, sexual gratification for this kind of feeling that I'm having. But right. sex isn't about reason. And sadly, it's also not about justice. Mm -hmm. And it's often not about kindness. And your husband was very unjust and unkind to you in this. But I do think that it can also be true that he, you know, he had a moment of weakness when you were yeah. gone. That doesn't mean that, you know, everything you've shared together is to be negated by this moment. That, that you know, if, if he's still worthy of your love and, and, and if he's worthy of your forgiveness, he'll prove himself to be that. Mm -hmm. And um, this can be, 
you know, you ask, can this be something that makes our relationship stronger? And I can say absolutely yes. Yeah. And, you know, I think that time will tell. I, I'm hoping, Married to a Stranger, that it's helpful for you to listen to our discussion of the previous letter. Because this was from a woman who's, you know, five years out from that affair. She chose to, to stay with her husband. And, you know, we can't say at this point, you say, where do we go from here? And I think where you go is... Uh, one step at a time, one day at a time, trying to make good decisions for yourself and your baby and your life. And it sounds to me like, you know, at this moment, you're feeling like you do want to try to heal this wound with your husband. And, you know, maybe you're going to be able to do that and maybe you're not. And I think that depends so much on, you know, how willing your husband is to be vulnerable to you and to make amends and to earn your trust back. Will your husband continue to deceive you and cheat on you and betray you? You know, that that will either happen or not. And I hope it doesn't, obviously, but I do think it's worth holding on a bit longer to see what happens between you. If you're worried about your husband doing this again and what you don't know, have the talk with him right now about what his needs are, what his frustrations are, and maybe that means you'll realize he wasn't as strong and together as you thought, and under certain pressures he has a predilection to try to seek a, a happy moment somewhere else, and then that's even more reason for you to have that knowledge and say, we need to try to take care of this in the context of the marriage, or I don't feel safe being in this marriage. And then that's another path. But you have to have a brutally honest, tender, ruthless discussion, maybe with a counselor that can make sure everybody's being held to account. And you need to do it pretty soon, now, I would say. Yeah. This is the crucial moment because your whole life and the life of your child and your husband, you know, it, everything's been turned upside down now. And you need to slowly but surely turn it side right up and in in closing married to a stranger even though this is incredibly hard and and painful one thing is you aren't married to a stranger anymore the shock was that your husband did something that you never imagined he would do but now you see and it does give you an opportunity to learn more about each other and develop a deeper trust and intimacy in in the face of this betrayal and certainly you're not the, you know, as, as you're hearing today, uh, you're not alone. You're not alone in this uh, subterranean world of learning something new about this person who you are the most intimate with. Mm. I think that that's the shock of infidelity. Yeah. All the and by ZipRecruiter. Some job boards overwhelm you with tons of the wrong resumes. Not smart. But ZipRecruiter finds the right people for you and actively invites them to apply. Smart. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash sugar. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. So, yeah, I mean, what Cheryl's really talking about is the, the unhappy fellowship of the betrayed. That's really what we're taking up. That's the sudden, unpleasant shock. And in fact, we have, I am incredibly excited about this guest, uh, Lauren Weedman, who we love beyond all reason because she's funny, incredibly funny, but also um, really unfortunately knows this terrain. Right. Yes, I've met Lauren Weedman a couple of times. You know, she's really such a talented performer. I've seen a couple of her one woman shows. And recently I saw a show in Portland called The People's Republic of Portland. Mm. And I'm sitting there, I'm in the front row with my husband, and the People's Republic of Portland is basically a funny show. And suddenly, about three quarters into it, she learns that her husband is having an affair with their teenage babysitter. And when she first said it, there was a kind of a laughter that went through because we couldn't believe she was serious. You know what she captured, Cheryl, in that moment was, to some extent, the disbelief you talked about earlier where you have your life and narrative going one way, and suddenly there's this betrayal. She transferred it to the audience. Yes. Like, oh, wait, what? It's that way now? Yes. And so there's this laughter, and she tries to make it funny, but it's not funny. It's devastating. And I had dinner with her after the show, and I asked her about you know what that's been like, what that betrayal has been like, and what's happened in her marriage and her life. 
And uh, I thought it would be great to have her on the show to talk to us herself. So we're going to call Lauren Weedman now. And I think some of you have probably seen her in the wonderful HBO series Looking. So we're big Lauren Weedman fans. Delighted to welcome her to the show. Let's give her a call. Let's do it. Hi. Hey, Lauren. How are you? I'm good. We're calling you today about infidelity. Yes. People cheating on people. Yes. And when I was reading these letters, when Steve and I were discussing them, you came to mind because I remember just (laughs) earlier this year, I was seeing your fabulous one-woman show in Portland, and you begin talking about your husband. I don't know if he's your ex-husband now, um, revealing that he was having an affair. Mm Mm-hmm. Can yeah. you tell us about that? Yeah, it's a pretty funny story. No, um, <laughs> uh, not so much. I was with Jeff for about 12 years, and then we had a kid five years ago. Anyway, forget the numbers. Yes, he um, had an affair with our babysitter, like the most embarrassing, weird, uh, just like a nightmarish cliche I can imagine, really. We had a babysitter who um, he hired um and uh, was in our home for about three years. Um, maybe saying Leo, and I will never know exactly the story, but they had a relationship, an affair that went on that whole time, and then they're still together. How did this get discovered? Or maybe that's yeah. inconsequential, but I, I just... Oh, no, it's so good. It's so not... It's, no, because it's the trauma. And like in um, the letter, the first letter from the Half-Hearted, she sort of found out about things by the police showing up at the door, and she didn't like go into details about it, but just the trauma. And man, when these secrets fester for a while, they fester and come out in such traumatic ways, I think, when things have been kept down for so long. Hmm. But how I found out about the whole thing was that I found a video that <laughs> I'm just the laughing is like, I'm so, it still just blows my mind that this becomes my story. You know, yeah. I'm like, God, I can't believe it. So I found a video and it supplied information that helped paint the picture. Wow. Uh, wow. What do you mean? Did you find a sex video? Um, <laughs> yes. It was a video that she had made for him, a sex video for him. It was, he wasn't oh, in my... it. And oh. I was in huge denial about what I was watching, too, because the whole time I was thinking, no. And then she said his name. And even then, Oof. like she says Jeff. And I'm like, well, I don't know. There's God. Everybody's named Jeff. I can't go two days if <laughs> right. somebody named Jeff. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like my friends and I were laughing about it. Uh, months after, they were like, she could have like given his social security number. When I've been like, I'm like, God, that's, I don't think there's a four in his social, so <laughs> this definitely isn't happening. Cheating was one of my worst fears, always. Right. And so I went completely numb. Huh. Why do you think you went calm, and when did you get angry? I mean, I'm assuming there was a point where you did, you know, become angry. I, I didn't have as much anger as I did grief. Uh-huh. I will have moments. I've had some very cheesy, corny moments where I'm like driving down the highway after coming from hanging out with friends and like playing music loud and, you know, the wind is blowing in through the, you know, and I have moments of like, it's okay. It's all worked out. It's okay. Like Leo's going to be okay. We're all going to be okay. And so I have... And Leo's your son, right? Leo's my son, yeah. Um, Can you imagine? Leo's the mailman. I've been most upset about the mailman. He's just, he doesn't know (laughs) where, what mail is forwarded, what's not. It's hard to find him. No, um, yeah, Leo's five now. And uh, so, yes, there's the highs. And then the grief thing, though, the thing that has helped me is to make sure that I let both happen. I don't try to go, well, I'm done with it now. And things are just better and happy. Because it surprises me because I'll think I'm okay. And then, like today, when I was dropping off Leo for his first day of kindergarten, and I have a moment of, I feel, you know, like, oh, look at Leo out there having to face his fears in his first day of school like that. And then I immediately start crying not about leo but about what happened with his life i'm like that's not what i planned on oh. like this isn't what i wanted and like how did i let this man who is so right duplicitous into my life so that will come back yeah and then i just mm-hmm. cry about it a little bit and maybe have a bummed out day but i try not to not have a bummed out day if i'm going to mm-hmm. try not to be in too much denial about it so that i can keep flowing with it and get better because it's so key that i have to constantly go but this did happen like sometimes i just can't accept it it means I'm, I, my mind just is like no he couldn't have done this to me and i have to always go this happened it happened he's with her it is this is what is like just breathe it in as awful as it is what a hard thing to do and it's exactly what I think anyone has to do who has to to face a new truth about the relationship. That's the paradox of the betrayed. 
you have the story that you have to carry around of being the person who is betrayed. It's humiliating, but almost right. inevitably, the person who betrayed, the betrayer is the weak party. But you have to carry around the story of having been cheated on with a babysitter. One thing for sure I will say is that after it happened, I'm like, this will not kill me. This is not, I'm not going to end up being someone who gets worse and worse mm-hmm. in my life. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Of course. Yeah, like, yeah. This has to make me stronger. It has to be okay. And it will. I mean, clearly it's all in transition. But do you remember that you loved Jeff? I mean, is there any piece of this yet that's started to be something that doesn't just make you stronger, but that you can actually envision a day that you and Jeff would be friends again? Yes. Yes. And it actually helped when I was writing, because I have been writing about this uh, infidelity. And I was so sort of cynical and bitter about it. But then I was remembering a moment that happened, you know, one of the moments I, how I fell in love with him, it's like I was in the sea of Cortez, it's all very, like, dramatic, and he, you know, doesn't want to come in, I ran in and going, like, skinny dipping, and he didn't want me to go in, because he thought it was too cold, and give me a heart attack, we were, we're, like, on our, we were on our first road trip together, in Mexico, in Baja, and he wouldn't come in, and finally, he comes in, but he's nervous, and, and it was, I remember loving that he came into the water anyway with me, even though he was scared, I'm like, you know what, it doesn't matter, He's going to do it anyway. Like, yes, he's nervous and he's scared and he's a fearful man, but he's going to do it anyway. That's all I ask. You know, we're going to be okay. And when I was remembering that, because I really had fallen for him in that moment when he came in the water with me, I had this image of Chanel being, that's, whoops, that's her name. It's fine. And Chanel's standing behind him. Like, I imagine that Jeff never came into the Sea of Cortez with me. He's standing on the shore and Chanel's behind him. And he gets to be the one kind of protecting her and telling her how she shouldn't go in and how dangerous it is. And how that makes him feel so much better as a man. Yep. And not to have me going like, oh, you won't come in? Right. You chicken shit. You know, which is me. Right. And I could see why he wouldn't want to come in, and I could see a, something good about him for staying on the shore with her. And I know that sounds like I'm like describing a dream or something, but I guess it kind of is. But it got, mm-hmm. I mean, I had a moment of like, oh, I, I loved him both. Huh. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's really interesting because you're describing basically being braver than him in a weird way. And I think this is partly, I don't want to say the the personality of the betrayed, but there are people in the world who are kind of fixers, who are always rounding up on other people's capacities, et cetera, and will even blind themselves to how fearful and weak somebody else is. And also create the idea inside themselves that they can work it out, you know, that they can help that person get into the water and overcome that fear. And then it's devastating to realize, no, actually, that person really was frightened and duplicitous and not only would have an affair and betray in that way, but would muddy the waters of your parenting in such a profound way and and create such profound confusion for your son. And, you know, that puts you in the position of, of realizing, wow, how much I was covering for him over the years. Mm-hmm. And you, even in that fantasy, you're still covering for him. You're kind of saying, well, but he was being brave in his own way. He's kind of protecting this young girl who's much more vulnerable and who he can feel more powerful around and, and more courageous around. It's fascinating. Also, you know, it's, it's almost not fair in the sense of how if he'd been this great guy in all these other ways, at one point it looked like he had just had a, a one night with her, a one fling. And I remember thinking, we could get over that. It would be hard, but I think he had to go that extreme to get me to get out of the relationship. He had to do something because I was not going to go. Because like, once I had Leo, I was like, that's it. We work it out. We keep fighting. Right. But then right. he just got worse and worse. And finally, I was like, oh, there's absolutely no choice at all. I, we're, we're done. Right. I mean, how much more can you take? You know, it's like that right. Blue Jasmine movie, whatever. There's no line in Blue Jasmine or Kate Blanchett's character. like, how many blows does a woman have to take before she starts screaming in the street? It's like, that's how yeah. I, I felt like, right. oh, really? And I think if you have somebody isn't that black and white, like they're not so evil in what they've done, I'm sure that's more complicated. And I was thinking about that. But if he had just cheated one time, if I could stay with him, and I thought, well, yeah, as long as we had our come to Jesus moment. And I thought that would be the, the thing that for people who I know that are feeling like, like the letter writers, like, I don't know if I can do this and can I do this? It's like, if you continue to feel like you don't have a human being in front of you, it's not going to happen all the time, but if you don't have those moments, then yes, it becomes really hard. Yeah. I think that this is something we're going to be exploring a lot, is this idea of when do you forgive? When do you give somebody a second or third or fifth or tenth chance? When do you say, 
no, you crossed a line and I'm going to move on. And I think that there's no one answer to that. I know there's no one answer to that. But I do think yeah. that a piece of it is, I mean, the most important piece of it is this question of like, is the person essentially willing to be intimate with you and honest with you and vulnerable with you? And are you willing to continue to love in the face of that vulnerability, that weakness? But my thing was I never had a family. Like I never, you know, I was adopted and I'd been divorced before and I could never find like my tribe, my people. And I was so blinded by my need for that. Yeah. It was so funny that I ended up with somebody who absolutely was the opposite of creating a family. Yeah. Um, I, I guess what I mean is that when, when something happens, as much as you think the other person is the evil of it, it's sometimes such an amazing thing because you get to see where you're at, like where your pain was. Do you know what I mean? What you're really talking about is profound, especially as we talk about the betrayed, because the real question is, what meaning does it have for you? There's the horrible yes. episode and why it happened and the weakness inside the betrayer. And then there's the separate question of what it means for the betrayed and what rock bottom foundational fears it awakens. And until you yes. get to that stuff, you don't get past it. Yes, exactly. To leave and to go through a divorce which is so rough, but it's just so much better to me, to know that Leo's mom isn't living like that. Right. And that I would could say to him, and I won't say this to him, I'm not like, your mother did the following wonderful things. That are <laughs> like, hopefully it's just exemplified. And, and, but whatever. I, I just was like, I, I would sometimes I had to use the sentence because I want to treat myself with more dignity than I do instinctually. Right. And so I had mm. to go, Leo's mother would. Interesting. Leo's mother would not do this. Leo's mom wouldn't do this. Wow. And it helped me to, to make some you know, decisions to have to go. Thank you, Lauren. I, I think that you have been exquisitely interesting and helpful to our letter writers and to so many people listening. Listen, when I talk about this story of what happened, like at Leo's preschool, and watching the, all these wives' faces, people just looking petrified as I'm telling the story, and I was like, wow, this is what they mean by dumping, because I feel so much better. I just dumped on them. <laughs> they look completely petrified, like, oh, my God, that can happen. I'm like, yes, it can. Enjoy your afternoon, ladies. Well, it's interesting, too. You, you, you bring up a really interesting point. Is this the ways that couples, like, we need each other to be good couples to, so that we ourselves don't have to doubt our own relationships. We also need to hear all kinds of different stories about the, the workings of love, you know? And I think that Absolutely. they can be educational and corrective and all of those things, which is why I think you've been such a great guest, offering all of this so insight. Much. Yeah. I'm always talking about this podcast. It's like, oh, they get down in it. My we dear can. friends, S and C. That's what I call you, S and C. Oh <laughs> like we have nicknames. All right. Um, so I'm happy about this podcast, too. I think it's freaking cool. See you, Lauren. <laughs> Bye, Lauren. Bye, Thank guys. you. You had a lot of crooks try to steal your heart. Never really had luck. Couldn't never figure out how to love. So this brings us... Well, the Department of Speculation, and the plot is a woman who is happily married, and suddenly her husband is having an affair with a co-worker, and it's mostly an emotional affair. And the central character, who is this married woman with a child, goes through so many of the things that the letter writers and our other letter writers, whose letters we didn't have a chance to share on the air, are struggling with. And this is just the wife talking to a friend of hers, who she calls the philosopher... There is one thing the wife tells the philosopher which she isn't sure anyone else will understand. If she tells it to someone else, they might think she's being self-deprecating, but she isn't being self-deprecating. She is being religious. The thing is this. Even if the husband leaves her in this awful, craven way, she will still have to count it as a miracle. All of those happy years she spent with them. It was a fucking miracle that I found him, she tells the philosopher. A fucking miracle past tense. They are sitting cross-legged on the floor like they used to in their dorm rooms. I think I was afraid to go all in, she says, because all in is terrifying. With all in, you lose everything. He nods, and suddenly they are both crying a little. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes, underneath everything else, the actions, the sins, the betrayals, the recrimination, is this fundamental question that lives underneath, which is, was I afraid to go all in? And the only way it even has a chance of working, and it still might not, but the only way it has a chance of working, especially in the face of these kinds of betrayals, is if you really are willing to go all in. Yeah. And, and if you go all in, 
there's great beauty in that and there's also great and then there's great danger risk. because That's you know right. you and, could and lose I, everything it's worth the risk but there's no question if you're all in and somebody betrays you it hurts it really hurts it hurts more we wish all of you not just the letters that we read today mm-hmm. um and the writers who wrote them but but the many letters we get dozens there's so many unanswered letters um because we just can't put them all on the show but we do try to pick letters that reflect groups of letters and so we hope if you did write us one of those letters that didn't happen to make this show mm-hmm. we hope you took some heart from it and we wish you all well both the betrayed and the betrayers well the betrayers we are going to get to next Next week week. and that will be its own kind of fresh horror so tune in for another episode of dear sugar radio infidelity part two the betrayers dear sugar radio is produced by wbur we're produced and edited by the fabulous and faithful lisa tobin (laughs) send your letters to us at dear sugar radio at gmail.com please listen and subscribe to us on itunes you can also find us on our wbur page the dear sugar page on that website that's also where you can find the show notes yes have a great week have a great one Had a love. Mm. hi i'm erica lance clearly you like dear sugar enough to listen all the way to the end so i think you might like this podcast i produce kind world Kind World tells deeply personal stories about the pivotal moments in our lives. She called me one day and she says, why are you choosing to live in our grief? And I said, I'm not, I'm choosing to live in your love. All of those women were witness to the darkest and probably most intimate moment of my life. And they gave me a sliver of light. I talked to all kinds of people about times when they felt scared or alone or overwhelmed and how they got through it with the help of others. I even thought I was a little crazy. But then I'm like, wait, I could do anything I want. I could raise a million dollars if I want to. I could cure this disease. I think that he bypassed all that bullshit and just said, I see a human being who needs my help and I'm going to help him. Head over to WBUR.org slash kindworld or subscribe in your favorite podcast app. Thanks.